that covers a lot of uh, territory and I picked some examples that I think are representative of the whole thing and you'll be able to see many different parts of the world and uh, how different people are addressing different subjects. Uh, so this is what we're faced with. Today we have to feed 7 billion people on a daily basis and out of which half of the population lives in an urban environment. In 2050, 8.3 to 11 billion people will, be, will have to be fed and more than half will be living in cities. So that implies a lot of transportation if we do not grow, if we do not produce the food as close to the um, places where it is going to be consumed. So <clears throat> the impact on the environment is considerable. And to put things in perspective, there is worldwide 800 million people who under one form or another are involved in urban agriculture which goes from Cairo where people on their terraces use the water from uh, the dishwashing to water some cucumbers or tomatoes and area, I've seen aerial pictures of Cairo and it is pretty much you know, a desert environment. And in the, on, to, on the rooftops, and there is a lot of flat rooftops, terraces, people have a few plants. So I think it is, the 800 million goes from people who have a few plants uh, on a terrace to urban farms and anywhere in between. The scary thing is that there is 21 cities that have over 10 million residents and the 10 largest cities range from 36 million to 11 million people. And in low income areas, people spend between 40 and 60 percent of their income on food, which is a huge amount compared to what we spend. So that has an impact on urban agriculture. A very interesting example is Shanghai, which is a city of 24 million people. And Shanghai can be compared to Jacksonville. Jacksonville actually is larger than Shanghai because Jacksonville is Duval County. This is why Jacksonville is known as the largest city in the world. However, if you put Shanghai at the scale of Pinellas County, it would range from a distance from Sarasota to Tarpon Springs. 24 million people there. And in that same space, they produce 60% of their vegetables, 100% of the milk, they don't drink a lot of milk in uh, China. They are drinking more and more, but they produce 90% of their eggs, 50% of the pork and poultry meat, and it creates 800,000 jobs within the Shanghai, the, not the downtown, which is extremely densely populated, but the peri-urban area, which is around it. And agriculture and food production are integral part of the city's long-term planning. In other words, there is a very long tradition in Shanghai, and you'll see a picture of Shanghai. And you see between here and the center of Shanghai, that's about the same distance as downtown St. Pete to Taupin Springs. And all the green that you see around it is not parks or recreation areas. They are farms that have been there for several thousand years. The wealth of Shanghai 
has been because it was on a river, but also because there is a lot of canals that are serving, deserve, uh, that are going into all those green areas. And Shanghai, the food was brought in by boat in the morning, and at night, the boats would go back to the farms carrying night soil. And I'll let you imagine what um, uh, it was. But, and it was the same boat. <laughs> And this is one of the reasons why we have built uh, our immune system because of exposure, you know, only the strongest survive. <laughs> so, to put it on a scale of, you know, Pinellas County, uh, Shanghai does not extend much further up. So, basically, from the top of the map to the bottom, that is the distance from Sarasota to Copper Springs, and about the same distance uh, with Wise. I went on Google Earth and I randomly now, you know, focused on one area. And you'll see the canals that are providing water for irrigation, but you see also the greenhouses, the fields. It is extremely intense production, which it has to be because of the numbers that I showed you. The other place that is remarkable is Havana. In the 90s, uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, they were cut off from fertilizers and petroleum products, so they had to convert to organic uh, growing, and they, there was a lack of food, so they had to adapt very, very quickly. And people who were illegally having legal uh, gardens, uh, backyard gardens, all of a sudden became heroes and uh, now they have 45,000 heroes growing over 26,000 gardens and 60 to 90 percent of the fruit and vegetable consumed in Havana are grown uh, in an urban environment and <clears throat> so out of necessity uh, Havana became a world leader in urban agriculture. This is a, an example of a residential area and a park outside. And if you go on the map of Havana, I, uh, I was looking at you know, green space, places that look like urban farms, and I found one area and I, I found that uh, photograph of this uh, detail. One interesting thing, you see they have raised beds, and you see what those, what the raised beds are made with? They are old tiles. So that is recycling and it's clay tiles that they have reused to make those beds. Rosario uh, in Argentina is another remarkable example. It was an industrial area, very depressed with the economic trouble they had in the 90s. Terrible unemployment, really, Tremendous poverty. And at the same time, a little bit like Detroit, they had quite a bit of space. And the city decided to allocate available land to people who are motivated and to turn the economy around through urban agriculture. So they gave or they made available the land to people who were motivated and they organized cooperatives and urban farms, gardens, and they turned really bad slum areas into housing areas with attached to it food production. And the next one I'm not going to show you a, a photograph of a farm of, uh, in Rosario. What I think is particularly interesting is the commentaries that are underneath. And they say they have production groups that get together as cooperatives, and they have not only, like in Cuba, not only vegetables, but also medicinal plants. And they have markets where they sell the products and also artisanal products. So, in other words, through 
the production of urban agriculture, they have developed a whole small-scale artisanal industry. Down below it says urban social cooperatives where they process the vegetables and also cosmetics based on natural products. And, and they, they talk again about uh, cooperatives where they have community kitchens with ovens and production facilities. So urban agriculture can be the source of a whole employment source through the creation of jobs, the uh, through the transformation of those uh, products. Kumquat jams, soaps with uh, beeswax and so forth. London, you would not think of London as a place where you would find urban farming. However, there is 3,000 people who are involved in commercial urban agriculture. 1,200 acres in fruit and vegetable production in the peri-urban area. So it is like Shanghai, where there, is, there are zones that are agriculture, and that are in the immediate vicinity of the large metropolitan area. And within the heart of the city, there is 260 acres of community garden that are protected by law. So there is an ordinance that says that this place cannot be built on, it has to be kept as a community garden. And there is 16,000 tons of fruit and vegetables from community gardens and urban farms that are produced. 9,800 acres of home gardens devoted to fruit and vegetables. And this is still within the London and the immediate area. And London, the center of London, produces 27 tons of honey. So the lindens that are planted along the streets are, you know, being used by the bees. And uh, this is a photograph of uh, an urban garden in uh, London. This is a, a completely different thing. This is in Bourges, where my sister lives. Actually, she gets every week a basket of vegetable that comes from uh, some of those gardens. And you see that building that is on the horizon? That's a 12th century Gothic cathedral. So you see the size of it. I think it is, it, it is built on a hill. And from the Roman times, there was a, a Roman camp there. And a whole half of the access of the Roman camp was marshland because there are two rivers. There is a convergence of two rivers. Over, the, over time, and that was done for protective purposes because those marshes were impassable or very, very, very difficult. And you certainly couldn't get people with armor, you know, to uh, wade through it. So over time, they dug those canals, put the dirt within an enclosure with wood, and they built up gardens, and they never have to water because the water seeps in. And it is a beautiful area. It is a UNESCO site. It's not because of the cathedral, because of that. And it's 350 acres, and this is a close-up and you see how beautiful and very well tendered. So there's a little harbor and everybody has a flat bottom boat and they have a pole and they go to their gardens. And a lot of people have a little plot with a little house and they just go there on Sunday, they bring a picnic, they have friends and they have games and they uh, grow their garden and they go and pick up the lettuce in the garden and they serve it there. Here we go to another extreme again. This is uh, the Brooklyn Grange on top of a building in uh, Brooklyn that overlooks uh, Manhattan. And uh, it is a little over an acre and they brought in several truckloads of dirt and they produce vegetables there with the uh, 
uh, skyline, the Manhattan skyline uh, on the horizon. Urban agriculture, uh, this is a picture in New Jersey of old buildings that instead of tearing them down, they are going to be repurposed to grow vegetables. And they expect to grow two million pounds of vegetables a year. Now, in this photograph and you know, in this operation and like some others that you're going to see, they are not gonna grow potatoes. They are going to grow high value, short growing time. So they will grow baby lettuce and things like this, which they can harvest in uh, three weeks. And they sell to $10, $15 uh, a pound. Uh, when I was in New York two weeks ago, I uh, went to Italy, uh, which is spelled E-A-T-I-L-I, -I. and um, they have some produce or produce department, and they had some uh, radicchio at $38 a pound. I'm showing you how this is going to be grown. They are going to be using aeroponics. And the principle of this is that you have some tubes that you can see at the bottom that spray a very fine mist on the roots. So the roots absorb the nutrients. They are not saturated by uh, water. The water drips. They can somewhat dry. They stay moist, but they don't suffer. And the plants grow 24 hours a day because of the LED lighting above it. So this again, on one acre, you can grow three acres of plants because of uh, this system where you can stack them. High labor, but also high uh, margin. This is another example. It's in Brooklyn also. And uh, they have three locations, some uh, grocery stores, and in particular Whole Foods, is putting some greenhouses directly on top of the store and they sell the produce right down below. So <clears throat> the food loop is very uh, extremely short. This is another example of uh, really high-tech growing. Uh, plants absorb mostly red and blue UVs. And uh, so if you focus, if you have LED lights that are just in that range of the spectrum, they grow faster. They grow uh, medicinal plants. It's almost a sterile environment and they need you know, the highest purity of plants. So that is something that basically any warehouse can be turned into this. In Chicago, the, there is a place called The Plant, which was an old pork slaughterhouse that has been turned into an urban farm where they are using that system. So we've surveyed a little bit what is going on around the world. You know, we could spend a whole evening uh, and not cover the subject. I thought it was interesting to see what is happening in our own area. Hydroponic in the Tampa Bay Urban Oasis Farm and Market. So they produce the vegetables and they sell them there. It is chemical hydroponic, it is not um, uh, organic. Urea farms grow vegetables in a warehouse and then you see the, the panels are brought in the restaurants and the servers when you order a salad goes with a pair of scissors clip it put it in the bowl they make the salad and you eat it however you have they have to transport the roots and the metal and the thing from the warehouse to the store to the to the restaurant so it's a little bit of a gimmick but understand that urban agriculture is still in its infancy and they are and many people are trying many different things and this is one of them what they do they grow it on vertical panels and they have the lights so the panels are maybe this far apart 
and they have rows of lights that move on a track maybe uh, six feet each way so that each plant is exposed to the proper amount of light it's not too much the intensity is so it's very well thought out but the produce looks beautiful. I've seen some uh, at the Vinoy, they have, they have a display. But to me, I would rather eat lettuce that has a little dirt on it. And that is Sweetwater Farm. I'm sure many of you have been there or know Rick uh, Martinez. And then we have closer to here, the Gateway uh, Organic Farm in uh, Clearwater, just a little north of uh, Almerton. Three acres in Ruskin. Three Boys Farm, which is not certified organic, but instead of using chemicals, the nutrients are a derivative of uh, molasses that they brew in a certain way. And they have some uh, pretty nice vegetables. And what they are trying to do is to do some automated greenhouses that are going to be on top or on a terrace of a hotel, of large hotels, so they will, and they will be able to control everything remotely and uh, only intervene uh, when they need to. One thing that is pretty amazing is that they grow year-round. Even in the summer, when temperatures in the greenhouse is 130 degrees, where you cannot stand, you cannot stay, and it is too hot, but the plants can still uh, take it. So, a lot of pretty advanced technology going into urban agriculture. So, in our community, what does all this mean is that we have a need for professional farmers and gardeners to meet a growing demand of local produce at retail and wholesale. Restaurants are going to uh, you know, want to have local products and people want to eat also local, local products. Uh, that creates also a need, there is a need for health and science education and a garden and a farm is really an ideal place to do that not only for the physical health, but also for the mental health. It can have a great, it can have a great impact. And the more uh, gardens there are, the more they can be used, not only to produce food, but also to teach and to of offset the nature deficit that a lot of kids are, and adults, lacking. And uh, also, it creates opportunities to recycle uh, organic matter, whether it is city mulch, you know, yard waste. The city spends about a million dollars a year to collect and dispose of yard waste, which basically, over a hundred years, is turning the city into a desert at the tune of 50,000 tons a year. And by keeping this organic material and looking, instead of looking at it as a waste, if we look at it as a resource, we can incorporate with that yard waste, which is rich in carbon, food waste, which is rich in nitrogen, and turn it into really good soil, which would avoid the city spending $38 a cubic yard to bring compost from the other side of Tampa at $38, uh, $38 a cubic yard plus uh, shipping cost. So there is a lot of opportunities of employment and remember what happened in Rosario is that when you have those fruit and vegetables, part of it is going to be consumed fresh but part of it could be turned into pickles and uh, other things and jams and, you know, uh, preserved uh, vegetables, 
uh, fermented vegetables, which would create jobs and contribute to the local economy. So now, that's the lesson. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.